It is simultaneously one of the best and worst examples of what is possible when it comes to the creation of a toy line and its evolution. One of the best because it was way ahead of its time capitalizing on some of the best features of popular toy lines from around the world. One of the worst because it relied so heavily on reboot, recycling, and the exhaustion of all earned emotional capital over the four decades of its existence until all that was left were Echoes. Hi, I'm Dan Larson, and this is the History of Micronauts. Micronauts was a full line of action figures, vehicles, and playsets from Mego that first hit shelves in 1977. The figures were highly articulated, helping set a standard for posability and playability that was ahead of its time. And furthermore, Micronauts featured modular parts that allowed you to customize the look and function of the toys to suit your adventures. Innovative pocket-sized robotic action figures with futuristic spaceships, robots, moon bases, all of that supported by a series of Marvel comics helping to establish a mythology that grew from the toys, a formula that Marvel would utilize to its great benefit over the years that followed. The very short version of the Micronauts' origin story is that they were licensed from a previously existing Japanese toy line, repackaged for the U.S. market, and supplemented with original figures and vehicles. Regionalization, that is, the renaming of characters and places, redubbing of voices, and omission of culturally unrelatable scenes, was and is a common practice for cartoons, movies, and toys that are successful in one country, imported into another. Regionalization was responsible for introducing the United States to Japanese franchises like Speed Racer, Gigantor, Star Blazers, Astro Boy, and lots of others. It is far cheaper than coming up with something original on your own. That said, Migos Micronauts were the result of more than just regionalization, but to get to that point, we have to go back a lot further. Mattel had a significant financial success with the creation of Barbie in the early 1960s. Hasbro recognized there was a formula that could be applied to a military and adventure themed toy, the same way Mattel was applying it to a fashion toy. Sell the base doll, then keep the revenue stream flowing with supplemental outfits, accessories, vehicles, and playsets. G.I. Joe, the first official action figure, was introduced by Hasbro in 1964. G.I. Joe was a huge financial success and attracted the interest of other toy manufacturers from around the world. By 1971, Hasbro had licensed the body, name, and supplemental merchandise to Palatoy in England and Takara in Japan. In 1972, Takara reformatted that G.I. Joe base body into something that was a bit more relevant to the Japanese consumer. Instead of an American military man, a new mythology was developed for a line called Henshin Cyborg, essentially a robot who could henshin, or transform into other superhero characters through the use of supplemental costume kits or other functions via modular limbs and weapons similar to Ideal's Captain Action. And then in 1973, the global oil market exploded for reasons that I'm not going to get into here. All you need to know is that A, oil is necessary for the production of plastic, and B, over the course of a single year, the cost per barrel of oil increased 400%, forcing companies that manufactured plastic items to reconsider how and what they made. In 1974, Takara shrunk Henshin Cyborg down from 12 inches to 4 inches and introduced a new line called Microman, similar concept with respect to modularity, less emphasis on changing into other superhero type characters, more opportunity to design and sell vehicles and playsets, and not for nothing, but smaller figures take up less space in general. All signs pointed to it being the correct practical evolution of the line. The geniuses at Takara also had the brilliant idea that these figures were not miniature representations of Microman characters, they were the actual size of the Microman characters. They were called Micros and came from the planet Micro-Earth, and while on our Earth, full-size Earth, they disguised themselves as action figures. This would be a key factor years later in 1983 when Microman evolved into Microchange and incorporated robot allies that could henshin or transformer into everyday objects like tape recorders, microscopes, and guns. In 1976, Mego was absolutely dominating the United States action figure industry. They were the manufacturer of toys and collectibles for the most popular shows and movies from Planet of the Apes to Happy Days to Starsky and Hutch and Wizard of Oz. Their world's greatest superheroes and comic action heroes offered two different scales of figures and included characters from Marvel and DC. They owned the rights to a multitude of popular celebrities like Sonny and Cher, Farrah Fawcett, and Diana Ross. 
Looking to continue their expansion and dominance of the market, Mego got an early look at Microman toys that were going to be shopped around to potential U.S. distributors and immediately bought the rights and the physical tooling used to make the toys. It was different than anything else on the market at the time and would allow Mego to establish a new, unique, cutting-edge identity in the toy aisle. Mego renamed the line Micronauts and had them on display in early 1977 and on the shelves for sale later that year. Most of the initial offerings were direct repackages sampled from two years' worth of items already produced by Takara for Microman. Mego attacked the airwaves with commercials and print advertisements, selling kids and parents on the look and the versatility of these colorful, new, highly articulated, interchangeable toys. The draw was the innovative play structure, not so much the mythology. We knew that the Micronauts were the good guys and the Acroyers were the bad guys. Have fun, make the rest up yourself. Series 1 featured a variety of figures in a variety of colors and made from a variety of materials. Time Traveler, Space Glider, Galactic Warrior, and a Croyer. Deluxe robots like Biotron and Microtron. Vehicles like the Galactic Cruiser, the Photon Sled, the Warp Racer, and the Hydrocopter. The Astro Station Spaceship, and even the Star Station Playset. Sales were immediately very, 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 very good. Mego instituted an internal policy of buying up every science fiction license that came on the market to protect their golden goose, or even anything that might be a competitor that might threaten the Micronauts market. Logan's Run? Bought it. One Million BC? Bought it. Doctor Who? Bought it. The Flintstones? Bought it. Happy Days? Bought it. King Kong? Bought it. Flash Gordon? Bought it. Superman the Movie? Bought it. Kiss? Bought it. Star Wars? We'll come back to that. In 1978, Mego created a few original characters that were a slightly larger scale and had some unique features compared to their Japanese counterpart. Force Commander and Baron Karza, the leader of the Micronauts and Acroyers respectively, utilized a previously existing mold with a magnetic connection system. Both were based on the Japanese figure of Kotetsu Jig. Jig was part of the Microman Titan subline and, for the U.S., was remolded in red and white for Force Commander and black and red for Baron Karza, each getting a unique new custom head, each getting a matching horse that they could combine with. Ouch. 1978, a new base character design called Pharoid, new ships and a new battle cruiser. 1979 would see the addition of more robots that were slight retools and recolors of existing robots. Biotron was now Phobos, Microtron was now Nemesis. And 1980 would see Mego push into a new era of Micronauts with new characters and an unforgettable visual style. We'll return after these messages. You can pretend this is the transportation system of the future. Rocket tubes with automatic parachute jump and launch pads. The electric air power terminal lets you blast up, down, forward, and back again. Plus, you can build a towering parachute jump and plane launching pad or any other layout you can dream up. Even run it in the dark. Rocket tubes with automatic parachute jump and launching pad. Assembly required by Mego. Mego introduced alien characters that were not reuses of Takara parts. However, they fit right into the look and feel of the line. Centaurus, Kronos, Membros, Repto, and Antron, all unique styles of aliens and standouts as action figures. The aliens and vehicles from that wave featured artwork by Ken Kelly, who had made a name for himself after his work was featured on the KISS album Destroyer. He was and is a brilliant and prolific horror, science fiction, and fantasy artist whose depiction of those alien toys and vehicles have become inseparable from the Micronauts brand. In 1979, Marvel Comics began publishing a Micronauts comic book after writer Bill Mantlo's son received some of the toys as a gift. Bill was so inspired by the toys, he brought them to then-editor-in-chief Jim Shooter and sold him on acquiring the license and letting him write the book. The core of the concepts and many of the characters are based on the toys themselves, but Bill didn't limit himself to just those pre-existing designs. He sought out to create a fully realized world that wasn't restricted to just the items that were in production or could even necessarily be produced. It established a formula for Marvel Comics, literally helping create and reinforce the mythology for a line of toys, a formula that they would repeat with brands like Star Wars, G.I. Joe, and Transformers. The Micronauts were officially from a place called the Microverse. Commander Arcturus Ran has been on a 1,000-year voyage. His body held in space sleep while his mind is merged with his robo-body double Biotron. When he returns to his home, he finds that Baron Karza has risen to power, supplanting his own family as the rulers of the realm. Baron Karza gained his power, his superpower, and, well, his armored form through his control of the body banks. See, to incorporate the modularity of the toy line, the official mythology features body banks, places where uber-rich folks can upgrade their physical forms to extend their lives while poor people are utilized for their parts and stuff. It is 
Too close for comfort right now, Marvel. Commander Ran, who is basically modeled after the space glider figure, joins forces with his co-pilot Biotron, a robot called Microtron, and an Acroyer named Acroyer, because Acroyer is a race of beings named after the guy named Acroyer, which is him. They are joined by characters not based on any of the toys, including Princess Mari, one of the last surviving members of the royal family, and Bug, an insect-like humanoid alien creature. They star in 59 regular issues and two annuals from 1979 to 1984, and then in a second title, Micronauts The New Voyages, 20 issues from 1984 to 1986. Not only running longer than the entirety of the Micronauts' life on shelves, but also existing mostly after Micronauts had already disappeared from shelves. For a good two years, 1977 and 1978, Micronauts were a powerhouse without a realistic threat in the toy aisle. At its peak, Micronauts accounted for nearly 30% of Miko's total revenue, an estimated $32 million out of the $110 million total. But that changed in 1978 when Kenner delivered Star Wars with a Death Star strength beam of irony. See, Legend has it that Mego, the company known for licensing everything even remotely science fiction related specifically to protect Micronauts, passed on the rights to Star Wars, allowing it to fall into Kenner's lap. Now, in recent years, as late as 2019, Marty Abrams, the owner and brains behind Mego, has pushed back on that story, saying that the rights were never offered to him in the first place because he absolutely, definitely, positively would have bought them a duh. He said that he was uh, out of the country doing licensing stuff when the Star Wars rights were being shopped and it was all just bad timing and bad luck. In his defense, Micronauts did really well. In 1977, it was hard to argue that Micronauts wasn't the right investment compared to the unproven Star Wars. It wasn't until Star Wars became a worldwide pop culture phenomenon and in the years that followed, and Mego had to file for bankruptcy after the entire toy market shifted to anything and everything related to Star Wars that it became clear that it wasn't the right choice. Mego had bet all that Micronauts money on electronic toys. They invested heavily in research and development. They had also been taken to court by Kenner in 1980, who claimed that Mego stole their Stretch Armstrong technology for use in their Elastic Heroes line of stretchable toys. If only Mego hadn't passed on the Star Wars license by being out of town and never having been offered it. Micronauts was officially discontinued in 1980, which was followed by the complete dismantling of the company and sale of all assets in 1982, which was performed in a questionable manner and did land Marty Abrams in jail for defrauding the company. Migos molds were dispersed to the ends of the earth. Our Toys bought a bunch of them and immediately turned out a line of toys called Interchangeables. Same stuff, different colors, cheaper materials, clogged the shelves with toys that kids had already moved on from. Pack Toys bought some stuff and released the Lords of Light line of figures. For more on that, check out our video, Can You Help Solve the Lords of Light Mystery? But no pop culture phenomenon stays gone forever, right? In 1997, Marvel Comics took another swing at Micronauts, greenlighting a series by writer Sean Burry and artist Carrie Nord. Updated character designs, modern approach, five issues worth of scripts were written, three were penciled, but Marvel wasn't able to acquire the license and the series was canceled. In 1998, Abrams Gentile Entertainment, AGE for short, the company co-founded by Marty Abrams after the demise of Mego, announced a new five-part Micronauts animated series to be aired on the Sci-Fi Channel in 1998. It would tee up a 26-episode series that would air in 1999, maybe on Fox, maybe other places. There was going to be action figures, Marvel comic books, probably lunchboxes and stuff. That too was canceled, but this time for being too ambitious, for reaching too far, for dreaming too big. Plans were for a show that featured a mix of CG animation, live action actors, probably some animals, special effects, green screen, sunscreen, food services, spared no expense. They were even going to have a line of technology-based toys in 2000s, maybe like light zappers or something? We'll never know. In 2002, Image Comics took a turn. They managed to run Micronauts through 11 issues and a four-issue Baron Cars Limited series before that all got canceled as well. That same year, Palisades Toys acquired the license to reissue the original Micronauts toys using the original molds, but... Surprise! The original tooling and molds were no longer owned by AGE, and Palisades was forced to reach out to the collector community to acquire vintage pieces to try to recreate molds to use in manufacturing the line. The reissues were a mix of some Takara originals and some of the Mego creations as well, but the hassle of getting them made was just the beginning. The reissues were produced at a factory that utilized subpar materials. 
The result was fragile and defective figures. Palisades attempted to recover by switching factories and delivering a stronger product in Wave 2, but retailers and fans were already scared away by the first wave. The Micronauts fiasco was a major contributor to Palisades' own bankruptcy in 2006. And this is a good time to talk about generation loss. This is the phenomenon by which each successive copy produced from a copy of an original results in a diminished quality. The first copy is pretty good, almost indistinguishable from the original. But the copy of that starts to show flaws. Those flaws are compounded with each new copy of a copy. Just a thing I thought I'd bring up in the middle of this video. Anyway. In 2004, Devil's Due Comics stepped into the batter's box, took a swing, and delivered three issues with art by one Mike Broderick, who had been an artist on the original Marvel series back in the 80s. Unfortunately, while additional issues were solicited, none would be delivered as the book was canceled. In 2005, state-of-the-art toys showed off their new prototypes for a six-inch line of Micronauts figures. The idea was to release in late 2005, but by 2006, they were still shopping those initial concepts around. Lobros, Baron Karza, and Space Glider were prepared for launch, but in 2006, Soda President Jerry Macaluso was enthusiastic but also realistic about the state of the collector figure market at the time. Unfortunately, even though he considered funding the line with his own cash, Sota was unable to raise enough retailer interest to get the figures produced before their license expired, and the line was canceled. There's a saying about toy lines that I invented that goes, you either die independent or you live long enough to see yourself acquired by Hasbro, which Micronauts was. And in 2011 at New York Comic Con, Hasbro rolled out a single issue intended to tease a new shared universe of Hasbro products called Unit E. Action Man, Gem, Transformers, Battleship, Mask, Rom, Stretch Armstrong, and Micronauts. That too was canceled. The time to go from announcement to cancellation getting shorter and shorter, as if a Micronauts announcement itself had become the only way to determine whether there was consumer interest in the brand as constituted. It was Schrodinger's toy line. The only way to know if it was dead or alive was to announce that it was back, but by then it was too late. It had already been canceled. In 2015, IDW Publishing announced a series of comics that would feature characters licensed from Hasbro, Rom, and Micronauts. But it's okay. This time, it worked out for the most part. Eleven issues plus tie-ins with other IDW books. That was followed up by five issues of a Baron Karza limited series. That's a success. It worked. Everything's okay now. We did it. In 2016, Hasbro released a special limited edition reproduction set of classic Micronauts toys for San Diego Comic-Con. Galactic Warrior, Pharoid, Orbital Defender, box art by Ken Kelly. They played the hits that the fans wanted to hear. In 2017 at San Diego Comic-Con, they released an exclusive box set of crossover Hasbro brands related to the Revolution series of IDW comics. Transformers, Mask, G.I. Joe, Rom, Action Man, Visionaries, and Micronauts. Included were tiny non-posable micro figures of Baron Karza, Acroyer, Biotron, Oberon, Quintilis, Fenello Fee, Zant, Betatron, and Gamatron. They also announced that a new animated series was in development intended for release in 2019, and I'm not exactly sure where that's at right now, not sure if it's cancelled, but it is 2020 and I haven't seen anything yet. But look, forget all that. Well, don't forget it, we worked really hard on this, just put it aside for a sec. The true measure of a toy property's legacy is a feature film. In 2009, Hasbro announced that Micronauts was now part of the Hasbro family of brands and that, fingers crossed, J.J. Abrams' Bad Robot Productions was talking about maybe possibly considering to produce at some point a movie based on or related to the Micronauts or Micronauts adjacent concepts. And then four years later, Rhett Reese and Paul Wernick said this, quote, We've written a couple of drafts of Micronauts and it's in the Paramount system now. We developed it with Bad Robot and it's probably not what you might imagine a Micronauts movie to be. It departs from the comic wildly, so if you hope it's loyal to the comic, you'll be disappointed in that particular sense. However, it's very, very different and very, very cool, end quote. As of 2015, Paramount was pretty sure that they were still probably going to make it at some point. Unless... Unless they needed to think bigger. In December of 2015, The Hollywood Reporter reported that BFFs Hasbro and Paramount were building the Hasbro Cinematic Universe. G.I. Joe, Visionaries, Mask, Rom, and Micronauts. That was followed by another announcement that an all-star batch of writers was doing something with all these properties, maybe even writing. In December of 2017, Paramount changed the release date for whatever they were making from October of 2020 to June of 2021. 
Two years later, in 2019, Dean DeBlois was announced as the writer and director of whatever the film is that will inevitably get canceled. Micronauts, man. A brand that currently exists as the byproduct of a series of cascading, compounding reboots and reconceptualizations with a half-life approaching absolute zero. Which is unfortunate because it was without question one of the most popular, most innovative, and most successful toy lines of all time. It was four inch scale before Star Wars. It was highly articulated before G.I. Joe, a real American hero. It was transformable before Transformers. It was a Marvel comic before any other toy line based series from Marvel Comics. It returned home to Hasbro after a 40 year journey Journey around the world from G.I. Joe to Henshin Cyborg to Microman to Micronauts. Thanks for watching. Please hit like, hit subscribe if you're not already a subscriber. Thank you very much to those of you who already are. If you're in the position to help the channel grow, please visit our Patreon at patreon.com slash toygalaxy or become a YouTube channel member. Both Patreon and YouTube channel membership have the same exclusive content, so choose your own adventure. Please share this video and let us know in the comments down below if you're still holding on, waiting for the next reboot of Micronauts. There is hope. If Hasbro is good at anything, it's capitalizing on every last nickel of value left in a brand. Maybe. Maybe if HasLab is any indication, they'll flip the script, roll out a line of giant figures and rebrand it Macronauts to make it in the big time. It's being the time big is what? now time to be big. <laughs> it's too hot for this shit. It's hot. <laughs>